Welcome again to our program that we have titled Revelation of the Coming King. I hope that you are excited about starting the book of Revelation. There is something, there is something when we special about when we study the Bible. It's, it's when our hearts are open to the Word of God, when the Holy Spirit speaks to us, to us through the pages of this book, there is something that happens inside. It cannot be explained. It can only be, be felt. As you know that this program is a part of that long series <laughs> in which we try to cover all the chapters of the book of Revelation. Not every detail, not every passage, because it is impossible. But we try, we're trying to understand what is that so special about, about the book of Revelation. Once again, I'm, I'm Ranko Stefanovic, professor at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary, Andrews University. I'm professor of the New Testament, but the most of the classes that I teach and more presentations that I make as I travel are on, on the topics of the book of Revelation and the time of the, of the end. Uh, I'm so glad to be with you here. And I hope that you have in your hands our textbook, infallible textbook, the best tool that we can have that can help us all those difficult issues and texts of the book of Revelation. But as we mentioned, it's almost impossible in the time that is allotted to us to cover everything that is in the book of Revelation. And the purpose of this uh, program is not really to present everything what is in the book of Revelation. It's rather to stimulate our appetite for the word of God. So once this program is over, that we can take different tools and I recommend it to you the, the tool um, titled Revelation of Jesus Christ, which is verse by verse commentary on the book of Revelation. Um, I hope that you have provided a copy for yourself if you have done it. Uh, I'd like one more time to remind you that we are still on the pages that were indicated last time. We are from the page 409, 409, and going and going on. We're in chapter 13 of the book of the book of Revelation. So from page 409, okay. You see, all these tools are great. And somehow they really present our limitations. <laughs> By the way, they show what at the present time we understand about the book of Revelation. And believe me, tomorrow I will learn something new. And day after tomorrow I'm learning something new. And there is never, never end of that. And that's the reason why I had to revise my commentary. In probably in a few years you will see another revision because there are so many new insights. There at Andrews University I'm chairing several doctor dissertations on the book of Revelation. So th there'll be new insight in a few years that, that will come. But what is most important is that we always, always ask God for his guidance. Amen. That we ask the Holy Spirit to give us that discernment, to give us that understanding, okay? And, and I know that some things to the book of Revelation that probably we will never be able to understand until the events are fulfilled. We are doing our best to understand with God's help. But there is one thing is that the Holy Spirit is teaching us how those messages, they can apply to our personal lives to make me to be better Christian, okay? To be better husband, to be a better friend, to be, to be uh, a, a better colleague, okay? But what is the most important to come much closer to God. And one day that I see myself, my family, and all of you one day in God's kingdom. That's what the purpose of the book of Revelation is all about. That's the reason why we would like to ask God for his guidance uh, as we are trying to understand uh, chapter 13 of the book of Revelation. Our heavenly father, here we are again coming to you and humbly asking you to give us your Holy Spirit because you promised to us when we come with open mind and sincere hearts that the Holy Spirit will guide us and instruct us into all the truth. So Father, please be with us and help us that we can understand these messages of the book of Revelation and to apply them to our daily lives. Father, we pray all of this in the precious name 
of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. As you know, we are in chapter 13 of the book of Revelation. And let me remind you once again what we tried to understand last time. We saw how the book of Revelation is amazingly structured. When you understand how the structure of the book of Revelation work, you can observe many things on the pages of this, of this book. One of those things that we tried to learn last time is that actually chapter 12, more particularly, okay, Revelation 11, 19, okay, divides the book of Revelation into two parts. We call it the historical part and the eschatological part, okay, eschatology is Greek. It comes from the word eschaton, which means the last thing, and logos, we have theology, astrology, you know, you know, all the things. Logos simply means teaching, doctrine, but the basic meaning of the word is the word, okay? So it simply means, eschatology means uh, teaching about the last thing. So when we say the eschatological portion of the book of Revelation, we mean the section of the book of Revelation, the last 11 chapters, they talk and focus exclusively, exclusively on the time of the end. Okay. And we saw how the book of Revelation is organized that show that actually it is in chapter 12. As he is preparing himself for the final events, Satan switches okay, in his tactic from what he was doing against God's faithful people throughout history by using force and persecution, coercion. But the time of the end, there is one single word, or maybe if you want two words, that really describe the activities and the time activities of Satan is the word deception or the word counterfeit. Okay, this is very, very important to help us understand what we can find in the last portion of the book of Revelation. So we saw that according to Revelation chapter 13, verse one, that as Satan decides to prepare himself for that decisive and final battle that is um, known from the book of Revelation, the battle of Armageddon. He is there on the seashore. Please keep in mind the symbolic language of the book of Revelation. And he is calling out of the sea the first of his associates that we will refer to as the sea beast because this beast, this political power, the beast is a symbol of political power, actually comes out of the sea and steps and steps on the sea. There is one more thing I would like us to pay attention as we are dealing with Revelation 13 and 14. You see, in dealing with the first 11 chapters of the book, we really dealt with the prophecies that were fulfilled in the past. Even though among, among the interpreters of the Bible, there are some slight disagreements. You know, if that event or that event, okay, fits the fulfillment of, the, of, of certain prophecies of the book of Revelation, generally people agree, okay? Okay. Uh, who believe in the prophecy of Revelation, they feel, uh, so it was not too much uh, difficult really to, to find out how the prophecy was fulfilled in the past. But the question is necessary now. You see, as we are dealing here with this section of the Revelation, we are dealing with not yet fulfilled prophecies. The prophecy, they are not fulfilled yet. We are waiting for that fulfillment, okay, to happen in the future. So do you understand that the difficulties is that? We have to keep in mind that we know exactly, as we mentioned it already several times, according to the book of Revelation, what will happen at the time of the end. We will see that the book of Revelation seems to me very, very clear about that. But what is the problem is that in dealing with these future prophecies, that sometimes people are using too much imagination their personal opinions and the way how they think that those prophecies will be fulfilled. Friends, you have to understand many of the prophecies will be clear to us 
at the time of their fulfillment. So we have to take, you remember, there are some things that God did not disclose to us. Do you remember that, that small book in Revelation chapter 10? John was not allowed to write everything. <laughs> Only what God found for good to us to reveal, it was revealed to us. And we know, we know what will happen. But how the things will happen, we have to wait for the time of their fulfillment. Mm -hmm. There is one thing that I would like to, I warned to all of us. There are people in the past who were great experts in biblical prophecies. They knew everything about the Messiah. They knew when the Messiah would come. They knew the date. They knew where the Messiah would be born. They knew how the Messiah would be born. But you see, so many times their private agenda prevented them from understanding really what the biblical prophecies meant. They put their ideas in those prophecies. So the Messiah came, they did not recognize him. Why? Because they didn't follow the clear instruction of the word of God. They follow their instincts, their desires, their plans, and their views how the prophecies should look like. So I would like also to, to speak to our, our viewers. This is a warning to all of us. I would like to suggest to you that we stick there to the clear text of the Bible. But those things, how the prophecies will be fulfilled. Yeah, the book of Revelation telling us enough how they will be fulfilled. But let's not go beyond that. Let's say to the, to the clear indication there, there in the book of Revelation, keep in mind, keep in mind that the future fulfillment of, of biblical prophecies will bring us to many, many surprises. So let's not repeat the history of the Jewish people. Yeah. Let's, be, let's be faithful to the word of God and try to find out what the Bible teaches us clearly. One more time, let's be reminded. We are dealing with the first of Satan's associate, associates. We call it, okay, the sea beast. Okay, the first one. But you have to understand something about the biblical prophecies. Last time, we wanted to make the survey of that in order to, to, to prepare the ground for what we are talking, to, talking about. Every time, every time, when the book of Revelation introduces a new actor on the scene, okay, the first John wants to identify that actor, to describe that, that actor. Once the actor is identified, then he describes the activities, what the actor is doing. You'll notice, we saw it, just, just, just to mention a few things. In Revelation chapters 5 and 6, John wants to tell us that the history will be unfolded because Jesus is doing that. But in order to tell us why Jesus is qualified to unfold the future by breaking the seals, first in chapter 5, he wants to identify Jesus. Okay. You see, in this section, who is a new actor here that steps on the scene in Revelation? It's Satan himself. But before John is telling us what Satan will be doing at the time of the end, what does he do? In Revelation chapter 12, he wants to identify Satan, to tell us he is the one who deceived a number of angels there in heaven. He was the one who was cast out from heaven. He was the one who in the history of the Christian church persecuted God's people. And this is the power, this is the, that arch enemy that will be involved in the final events. And he will play the key role there. Are you still with me? Now, the same principle must be applied with reference to the first of two associates of Satan. We call it the sea beast. Please, friends, this is very, very important because pe uh, there are some people who really do not know this principle. They're sometimes confused. And I will tell you where the confusion comes from. You have to keep in mind, this is the focus of the first section of chapter 13. John one wants to tell, uh, to t tell us about the first of Satan's associates, the activities that characterize and these activities will be repeated also at the time of the end. Are, are you still with me? But before explaining the, about the activities of the sea beast, John first wants to identify the sea beast. 
Why is this so much important? Please, I'd like you to turn to Revelation chapter 13. I'm using more opportunity that we get information how to interpret the book of Revelation. Once we know how to do it, we can do the rest for our, uh, by ourselves. Are you there? Let me now ask you a question. I want a little bit to confuse you. It says in verse 3, And I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed, and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. What do we have here? The beast received mortal wound. What happened next? The mortal wound was healed. What happened next? It provoked the admiration of the entire world of what happened to the beast. Because the beast was killed, now the beast came back to life. Now please, would you go with me to verse 5? There was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. Do you see the problem here? Are these 42 months before the mortal wound or after the healing of the mortal wound? Are you with me? Are you lost? You see, if you do not know these principles, and by the way, I'm explaining about these principles in the very beginning of my commentary. It's very important. If you don't understand these principles, then it appears that 42 months come after the healing of the mortal wound. That's why many people, that we call them futurists, as we explained it before, without understanding this principle, they speculate and they believe that those 40 months, they come after the healing of the mortal wound. But it's not so. Keep in mind that those, these first four verses, John first wants to identify the beast to tell us who actually this political power is and what this political power is. So what do we learn about this political power? What is that? That this political power is the same as the one portrayed where? In Daniel chapter 7. That there is no difference between the two. This power in the book of Daniel is identified as a little horn. You remember we talked about it. It was not really the little horn. <laughs> it grew up very powerful, okay, and, and, and great horn. In verse 2, we learn here, also, by, uh, reflecting to the book of Daniel is that actually this beast is the successor of the previous political powers that appeared, that appeared in history. Second thing John is, uh, wants, wants to tell us, and what is that? That this political power at a certain point in history will be killed and will cease to be active. However, eventually, that mortal wound will be healed. That will provoke the admiration of the entire world. Please, can you keep in mind something? We are dealing with the eschatological, we are dealing with the eschatological part of the book of Revelation. Really, John is not interested too much to tell us about what this political power did during the prophetic period of 1260 days of the medieval period. You see, he's providing the background to tell us about the power that will play a significant role and function at the time of the end. But he's telling us that that power that will really work so powerfully at the time of the end is not really a new power. Is the power that was active in history more than 1,000 years during the medieval period, that controlled the human, human minds. Are you still with me? Imposing one religion and controlling what people will believe, how it, how it will believe. Are you, are you still with me? This is the point that he's trying to, to, trying to make, that actually this is not a new power that will appear at the time of the end, that this power has a long history persecuting God's people and fighting against God and trying to take the place of Jesus Christ in this world. Are you still with me? Once he identified this power, now he wants to tell us what this power was doing in the past and what this power will be doing at the time of the end. That's why it's so much important that you understand the principle of identification of a new actor and then what comes to the next. The, the description of the activities of this actor. If you don't understand that, then you can go off the road completely and bring some interpretation and finally you will wonder that something that only you believe but nobody can see it in the text because that does not fit, fit the context. So what are the activities of this beast? 
Okay? Let's see now about the description of the, of the activities of these beasts. It says, verse 5, There was given to him a mouth, speaking arrogant words, and blasphemies and authority to act for 42 months was given, was given to him. Let's stop here for a, for, for a moment. I'd like to mention to you one feature that is so frequently found in the New Testament. You will notice that this feature is not too much represented in the Old Testament for one simple reason. What is the feature? You will notice here it says that it was given to him, to this political power, a mouth, and to do all these activities. Okay, it was given. It was given. Who gave? By the way, you have to understand something that the Jewish people came out of the Babylonian exile, came to Palestine. They decided to be so faithful to the law of God, so not to repeat the mistakes of their fathers and go back to another exile. They said, we want now to, to be so faithful to the, to, the, to the law of God. So they went to the Ten Commandments. They came to the commandment of the Sabbath. They made about 413 commandments of that. They wanted, they prescribed every detail of the observance of the Sabbath. They came to the second commandment. The second commandment, no, sorry, the third commandment. The third commandment said, you shall not take the name of God in vain. But what does it mean in vain? They said, so any taking the name of God in our mouth is in vain. We can be without that. So when they would come to statement, God spoke. Now they would make statement, it was spoken, implying that actually God spoke, okay? Or um, people were saved, implying that actually God saved them. They use passive instead of active. Are you, are you still with me? Today we call it the divine passive. So when you have a passive, it implies that actually God did it. By the way, in English, we use it so often, I am saved. What does it mean? It means that God saved me. I'm forgiven. It means God forgave me. We are using that passive because it comes, it comes from the New Testament. It occurs very, very often in the New Testament. So in the light of this information, when said that the beast was given a mouth, what does, what does it actually mean? That it was actually God who allowed this political power a certain period to exercise the authority and to do all these activities against God and to persecute God's people. You see, friends, this fact can really provide us with assurance that nothing in this world happens without God's approval. Please, I, 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 I cannot always explain why God allows certain things to, to happen. But I have the assurance is that God is still in control. So many times we don't understand. So many times we have a question, why? But we have the strong assurance that actually it is God and he has the final word in everything. It says, it was given to him a mouth to speak arrogant words. By the way, the number of biblical commentators who actually observed something that has been overlooked by many as they read the book of Revelation, that in the Old Testament, when prophets were given a mouth to speak, it always refers to a speech that person, that person delivers. It's not simply that the person casually speaks. It's an order. The person opens the mouth and gives direction and everybody, everybody has, has to follow it. So we're talking here about the political power. You remember what we saw that, that this political power was enthroned by Satan, authorized by Satan. And now this power was given actually to exercise the authority. It was given a mouth to speak arrogant words and blasphemies and receive the authority to act for 42 months. It was, it was, it was given, given to him. L let me remind you one more time. What we spoke last time in our last presentation is how Revelation 13 actually reflects Daniel chapter 7. And I have here in front of me, I have here a, a, a chart and you can see that all these activities, okay, of this sea beast actually 
uh, mirrors the activities of Little Horn of Daniel chapter 7. Let me just point to a few verses. In, uh, in Daniel chapter 7, we have the little war, uh, horn has the mouth speaking great things. You go here to Revelation 13, the sea beast has the mouth speaking great things. Going to Daniel chapter 7, the little horn speaks blasphemies against God. Here we have that the sea beast speaks of blasphemies against God. I'm referring to chapter 7, verse 25. All these informations are found there. And then in verse 21 of chapter 7 of Daniel, we have that the little horn wages war with the saints and overcomes them. And you have here in 137 that the sea beast wages war with the saints and overcome them. You can see actually that the little horn and this sea beast that is, that is mentioned here actually refers to one and the same historical reality of the power, okay, that controlled the minds of people for, for a long time. But we would like really to, to find out what those activities are all about. Okay, let's go back one more, one more time. It says, mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies. In Greek, it can mean that that mouth was speaking arrogant words, namely blasphemies. W why is that so? Because if you go to the Old Testament, there is only one entity that was speaking great words, and that's Lucifer himself. If you go to, to the book of Isaiah chapter 14, Ezekiel chapter 28, great things, what, it's not great things that the person make great speeches. It means great things that pertain to God there. This power claims the quality uh, uh, with, with, with God. By the way, it, it showed here in these blasphemies. The question is, what are the blasphemies? Of course, today, we can use our imaginations and we can, each one of us can have different interpretations, but we have to go to the, to the New Testament and to find out really what blasphemy meant at the time when the New Testament was written. The several texts I would like to remind you. The first text is in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 33. Please, I would like to go and to read this text because this is very important for the identification of this um, of this political power. Okay, so the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 33. Let's, let's read what we have there. Let's see what, what blasphemy meant. Okay, chapter 10, verse 33. Um, Jesus said, okay, to the Jewish leaders, okay, for a good work, no, sorry, sorry, the Jews actually said to Jesus, Okay, who asked him, why do you hate me? Why do you want to stone me? And the Jews said to Jesus, for a good work, we do not stone you, but for a blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself to be a God. We're not dealing here with the theology of this text. Was Jesus God? Did he do blasphemy? He did not do blasphemy. But Jews, they consider Jesus to be mere man, okay? And they said, you are a man and you claim to be God. That's blasphemy. Are you still with me? Let's go to another text, which is the gospel of Matthew chapter 26. The gospel of Matthew chapter 26. Okay. The gospel of Matthew chapter 26. Let's read verse, okay, um, 33 to 35. Keep in mind that Jesus is there on the trial before his crucifixion, okay? Um, he's before the high priest in the trial. But Jesus kept silent, and the high priest said to Jesus, I jure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are Christ, the Son of God. Are you still with me? Because Jesus claimed so many times to be the Son of God during his ministry. And Jesus said, You have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I'm telling you, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. You don't see anything significant here. Actually, in Greek, it's identical quotation from Daniel chapter 7 about the Son of Man. You remember that coming be before the ancient of the day. It's direct quotations. And the, for Jews, this statement was very, very important with reference to the Messiah. When the high priest heard that, he tore his robes and he said, he has blasphemed. 
What further need do we have witnesses? Behold, you have heard now blasphemy. What was the blasphemy? That Jesus claimed to be God, the Son, the Son of God. So we, we get now the first key. When this beast is speaking blasphemies, what does it mean? Claiming to be God, to take the place of God. But there is also another aspect of blasphemy in, in, in the New Testament. I'd like you to turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, verse 7. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, verse 7. Again, the Pharisees, okay? They're talking about Jesus. And they said, why does this man speak that way? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins by God alone? What is another aspect of, of blasphemy in the New Testament? When the person claims the prerogatives of God, especially to forgive sins that only God can forgive. Do we get now a little bit closer picture of what or who this political power of the sea beast is all about? Okay, one more time. This power is the successor of the Roman Empire. Are you still with me? It's a political power. A certain point of history, history, this political power is killed. Does not have a power in the world. But at the time of the end, this political power will come back to life. But in describing the activities of this beast, is that, that this, this, this political power has the same, the same desire, the same aspiration as Satan in the Old Testament, to be equal to God. And actually it is expressed it is expressed in terms of the blasphemy that this power claimed to be God okay, and claimed that it was given to, to, to that power the prerogatives of God like to forgive, to forgive the sins. But, but, but there, is, there is much more. There is much more. Okay. Verse 6. Verse 6. And he opened his mouth in the blasphemies against God. Against God. We saw it. What is blasphemy against God? Okay? To claim equ equ equality, equality to God. But says to blasphemy his name and his tabernacle. So this power trying to take the name of God upon itself. Okay? But second thing is that this power somehow tried to mess up what Jesus Christ is doing in the heavenly sanctuary. What is Jesus doing there in the heavenly sanctuary? Providing forgiveness of sin for us. But this power says, I can forgive sins. This is what blasphemy is all about. I can forgive sins. You don't, you don't need that sanctuary there, there in heaven. And says also blasphemies against those who dwell in heaven. Who are those who dwell in heaven? Let me remind you one more time. In the book of Revelation, God's people are the heaven dwellers. Amen. There are always those who dwell there in the heavenly, in the heavenly places. Actually, in Revelation chapter 14, verse 1, we will see as, as, as this beast is forcing the inhabitants of this world to accept the mark of the beast. God's people are on the Mount of Zion, uh, uh, Zion there before the throne of God. Apostle Paul talks in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6 and 19, that God's people, because they are redeemed by Christ, they are already there in the heavenly places. That they are reigning with, he, with, with Jesus Christ there on, on, he, on his throne. That salvation is secured there, there before God. So this beast, this political power, also tries to mess up with God's people. By the way, in the light of what uh, we had the description there of the power of the little horn, it means it persecutes God's people. Because these people have chosen to follow God and his commandments and what God is asking, asking them actually to do. By the way, let me remind you one more time. If you really want to understand a little bit about this power, this is the same power. And please, I would like to allow you to go back one more time to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Apostle Paul, the book of Revelation is not only a book dealing with that. Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, actually, he talks about the same power, the same activities. So please, would you, would you, would you go with me? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul said in verse 3, 
Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself about every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. And then Paul said, do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things. And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he'll be revealed. Uh, what is that that was restraining this apostasy to appear in the Christian church? Is the Roman Empire. It's actually the fall of the Roman Empire that opened the door. That this political power that is mentioned here in Revelation 13, now could come to that political power. And then Paul says in verse 7, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. And then he says, then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the, by the appearance, by the appearance of his, of his coming. Okay, friends, for me now comes uh, the most uh, difficult uh, portion of this because I know that there are many faithful Christians that are watching this program. And we live today in the 21st century when people try to forget the past and many bad things that happened in the past now to beautify and nothing happened. It happens also with the Holocaust. It happens with, with everything. But I'm sorry, this has nothing to, to do with the good Christians who are really sincere and they want to serve God. But we really si simply want to find out how this prophecy was fulfilled in the, in the, in the, in the, in the past. So the few things that we have to keep in mind, we're dealing here with the political power, okay, that dominated the Western world after the fall of the Roman Empire. How long, how long did this political power exercise its authority? By the way, I have now to mention something else. This is the political power. This is what the beast is all about. But when you read the clear description of these beasts in Revelation 13, you see that this political power is really also a religious power as much. It tries to take the place of God, mm -hmm. to provide the forgiveness of sin that only God can do. Mm -hmm. It wants to mess up with the heavenly sanctuary there, are you still with me? And persecuted God's people for how long? for the period of 42 months, or 1260 days, or time, two times, and half of time. We already saw that these three time designations in the book of Daniel and in the book of Revelation are the only places where they are mentioned. And always with reference to when the same thing is, is the Antichrist power that dominated the secular world during the medieval period and persecuted God's people. And please, let me deal a little bit with the principles of, of biblical prophecies. Do you remember when we started this series? At the very beginning, I think it was our second or third presentations, please, I forgot when it was. Do you remember what we discovered? That in the book of Revelation, the things that John saw in the vision, all those things were shown to him by means of symbol. Do you remember that? So we see here, please I need now your, really your attention is, we saw that the beast is not a real beast that will come out of the real sea. The sea signifies a human society, okay? The, the beast is a symbol of the political power. Even the description of the beast, everything is symbolic based on the base of Daniel. And many Christians, they recognize it except in one point, when they come to this time designation of 42 months, and they say, this is literal. Friends, you have to understand that in the book of Revelation, even at the time designation is a symbolic. Let me explain it in more details. You know, today we live in the modern world, we try to be literalistic as much as we can. But in the Old Testament, 
when people spoke in symbol, very often they used one day as a symbol for a year. I know, I lived, actually I was born and I grew up in the Eastern culture. People never talk about how many years they have to live. They always talk about how many days they have to live. People move to another place, they ask, how many days do you plan to spend there? And he said, 20 years, are you still with me? People always referred to years in terms of days. By the way, now there are many texts in the Old Testament that I can refer to. If you go to Psalm 90, David said, our days are counted before God. He meant actually years. So, so especially in biblical prophecies, in biblical prophecies, a day is used as a symbol for a year. Okay, this is very, very important that we that we that we keep keep in mind here. So, when we are dealing here with the power, okay, that will do all these things. Messing up with God's plan. We have a 42 months. Or we have a period of 1,260 days. And there is that third expression, okay, which goes in this way. In this way, okay, one plus two times and plus a half, okay? Okay, which really means two years, one year, two years, and half a year. If you put it into days, you get the same number of days, 1,260 and 60 days. So now the question is, this is very important for the understanding of this, of this power. So what are we talking here about? Prophet Daniel in chapter 7, he talks about the same thing, talking about the same power, the same time designation, what we are talking about. Well, the historicist interpreters, they concluded on the base of all those informations that we have here, that after the fall of the Roman Empire, there was only one religious political power that dominated the Western world. It was the Christian church. I call it in my, in my um, commentary, the ecclesiastical Christianity. What do we mean? The Christianity they became an institution but that uh, uh, power, okay, that dominated the Christian world had a leader, okay, in the form of the Roman papacy, Roman papacy, okay, that dominated the Christian world. Friends, it is not my purpose now that I provide to you all the evidences for that. Actually, any history book, any history book so clearly talks about what was going on during the medieval period. Keep in mind, I'm European. You see my heavy accent. If you, if you go there, it's still so fresh in the minds of people what was going on the, during the, the medieval period. You who live in Asia, you don't know about uh, dark Middle Ages because in Asia they don't have dark Middle Ages. They have the medieval period when science flourished, when civilization flourished. But in Europe, that was a dark Middle Ages. Okay. So the Christians, they concluded. They had a hard time to locate okay, these dates. So they concluded that this power came, rightly they concluded, in the year 1798, when Napoleon's commander-in-chief, Berthier, took the Pope from Vatican and put him in the exile and marking the end of the dominion of this religious political power during medieval period. So if you now take this date, deduct 1,260 years, what day do you get? The year 538. And really people have a problem, what really happened in the year 538? I don't want to go, I'm leaving that to historians. But we have at Andrews University a doctoral dissertation written that shows that by the year 538, the, the stage was set. The Pope by that time was fully established and recognized as a political le uh, 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 leader in Europe. Are you still with me? So that the year 538 really can take rightly and consider rightly as the beginning of this prophetic period of 1260 days. Are you still with me? So we are dealing with the period from the year 538 AD to the year 1798, okay, of the papal dominion 
over the Western world there, there in Europe. When this prophecy from Revelation chapter 13 was accurately fulfilled almost in all, in all details. So what happened in 1798? Actually, this religious political power received the mortal wound, was killed, okay? Actually, the papacy did not own the Vatican any, any, any longer. There was no any influence in the, in the, in the, in the world. By the way, um, that ancient tendency of the papacy as the governing body of the Christian church during all those centuries was the best expressed in modern times by Pope Leo XIII that we understand the book of Revelation says, we the Pope hold up on this earth the place of God the Almighty. I believe we don't need to go. I don't want now to go about negative things about anybody, but we cannot deny the historical reality. What, what, what happened? Are, are, you, are you still with me? This is what, what, what indeed happened. Okay. But friends, this is not the most important in the book of Revelation. Why are we talking about this? It's because of what will happen in the future. And according to the book of Revelation, the time is coming that this beast that is killed, it's still killed. We live in the time and this beast is killed. We do not have persecution by Roman papacy or by the Christian church in any Christian country. We don't have it. But according to the book of Revelation, the time is coming when this system, this institution will come back to life again. And what happened during the medieval period, it will happen again at the time of the end. But please, I'd like you to pay something now here in Revelation chapter 13. What will happen? What will, what will happen when the, this oppressive religious political rule, okay, finally comes back, back, back to life? You see, this rule was killed with the events of French Revolution when the traditional God-centered theology that dominated the Western world for more than 1,000 years was replaced by the human-centered and materialistic outlook that dominated the Western world for those centuries. But the book of Revelation is telling us something will happen at the time of the end. Please, would you go with me to verse 8? And all those who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world, in the book of life of the Lamb, who has been who has been slain. I'd like you that you pay attention to something here in the text. Can you go with me? Just to make a little bit, put into the fifth gear. I'll travel through Revelation 13. I want you, and I hope that our viewers will also uh, try to observe something important. I'd like you that you see about the usage of the tenses. You know tenses, past, present, or future. Let's go from Revelation 13, verse two. It says, and the beast which I saw was like the leopard. The dragon gave him power and the throne and authority. Verse three, I saw one of the heads as it had been slain. Okay, and the mortal wound was healed. The whole earth was amazed. They worshiped the dragon. There was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words. He opened mouth, verse 6, blasphemies against God. Verse 7, it was given to him to make war with the saints to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. We are talking about the medieval period of the great persecution of God's people. What tense is used here? It's always past. We call it the prophetic past. For John, what he saw, it was still in the future. But when he's in the vision, okay, because he is in the mood, he's in the state of the time of the end. So all of these activities are in the past. Are you still with me? But now I'd like you to notice something that happens in verse 8. And all those who dwell on the earth, what do you have there? Will worship him. All those whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Did you see the difference? Suddenly, from the past, John moves to the future. 
is telling us. Do you see that? All these previous verses, verse 7, are talking about the activities of the beast during which period. By the way, we'll try to illustrate on the blackboard in our, our next presentation. The activities of the beast that are presented here in first seven verses are the activities during the prophetic 1260 day period. Are you still with me? At the end of this period, the beast will receive the mortal wound. Are you still with me? The beast will be killed. But then what will happen? The mortal wound will be healed and the mortal wound will be healed. What happens? It will provoke the admiration, admiration of all the people on the earth. Are you still with me? Now, at this point, the description of these religious political power is concluded. So now people say, what's the big deal? The mortal wound will be healed. But you know what is the question that, that, that the uh, readers of the book of Revelation are asking? How will the mortal wound be healed? What will cause the healing of this mortal wound? Why suddenly the healing of the mortal wound would provoke such a great amazement, admiration of the inhabitants of this world? You see, friends, praise God that we have the second part of Revelation chapter 13. Because without that, our understanding of the biblical prophecies would be very, very vague. So there is a question. Let me go back one, one more time to the question. How will the mortal wound be healed? Now John is using the future tense. He's moving now to the future, okay? To the very time of the end. How will the mortal wound be healed? What will provoke the healing of the mortal wound? What is that that will provoke the amazement of the entire world? And John is giving us the answer. That at the time of the end, there is another political entity that will appear on the scene. You see, this beast is powerless. It received the mortal wound. It's dead. Does not have too much influence in the world. Yeah, it has big mouth, but short hands. Are you still with me? And no power and authority. But the book of Revelation is telling us that at the time of the end, another political power will step on the scene. And that power will cause the healing of that mortal wound. That power will make the sea beast with the same authority that that beast had during the medieval period. Are you still with me? And that this new power actually will be responsible and will be the key actor in the end time scenario. So since we have two, three minutes, I'd like to make a good introduction to that. Please, would you turn with me to Revelation Chapter 13, we are still in chapter 13. It's, it's in, verse, in verse 11, okay? In, in verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb and spoke as a dragon. And I know, I, I, I must find out how good is my audience here. Okay. Do you remember we already tried to understand the meaning of the symbol of the beast? It's a political power. We don't have a problem with that. But it says, did you notice that while the first beast came out of the sea, coming out of the disturbed human society, so, okay, from the turmoil of the human society, you will notice that this second beast came out of the earth. This is your final exam. What is the fact, the meaning of this fact, that this beast arises, comes out of the earth? Actually, it's definite article, the earth. Because John wants to tell us, do you remember in Revelation chapter 12, when Satan almost destroyed the church, that the new entity appear on the world stage. A friendly earth that actually provides a refuge <laughs> to the church, saves the church from, the, from, from Satan's effort to, the, to, to, this, to destroy it, okay? 
that earth that is so friendly from the church and saves the church from Satan. It is actually out of this friendly earth, I mean the earth friendly to the church, are you still with me? Now this second beast comes out. Can you say wow? That's something that we do not expect. But not only that. How to describe this beast? It says that this beast, this beast has two horns like a lamb. In the book of Revelation, the lamb, are you still with me? Lamb is used exclusively for Jesus Christ, except in this case. 27 times the word lamb is used. It's always with reference to Jesus Christ. So when John says that this beast had the two little horns like a lamb, it's another way is that this political entity is in a Christian robe, somehow resembles the authority and power of Jesus Christ. Are you still with me? The question is, what entity in history fits the description of the earth beast? There is one thing you will notice. When we are talking about the first beast, this first beast has a long history of activities. Minimum 1,260 days. Are you still with me? But about this second power, this power does not have any historical pedigree. It's a brand new power that appeared at the time of the end. When? When? At the time after the first beast received the mortal wound. Oh boy, we are now coming to a very interesting subject. You see, God knew what will happen in the future, and that's why we are studying these biblical prophecies. The purpose of these prophecies is to tell us that we have to study them, not to be surprised, because God, in his care for us, he wanted to reveal us to us, to bring us closer to himself, and tell us, don't be deceived.